Uh, I'm Bob Stevenson, Chairman. Uh, Logan, why don't you go? Logan Dunning, present. Rachel Pellia, present. Cara Frangipani, present. Marissa Lees, present. We have a guest, Steve. And here he is. Hi, everyone. We're just calling the roll, Mike. If you can unmute mute and let yourself be known. You're trying. Okay, well, um, did that, I'm here. Great, there we go. And Tim is here as staff liaison. I am here. Um, did I could not find any minutes. I don't know if I'm looking in the wrong place or what. I think, Bob, they were slightly delayed because of the holidays. So I think um, next month we'll have them for this okay. month. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure before we uh, moved on. Um, I, I think I, why, why not have the, I have the December 14 minutes. Is that not the right one? Yeah. Oh, it is. I didn't know they were done. <laughs> yeah, I have them. Um, where, where were they? Where'd you find them? Uh, Nina sent them. Today? She sent them on January 6th. Why can't I find them? Huh. Well, uh, yeah, I can send you. I'll just forward it to you. Just a second. Let me see if I can find them. Anyway, while we're looking that up, Steve, why don't we just move to you and we'll listen to your report if that's okay. All right, let me pull up my presentation. And can everyone see that and hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. uh, well, I'm Steve Simon. I'm the deputy director of utilities uh, overseeing our engineering group. I've been here coming on um, two years now. And so one of the, the functional areas of our engineering division within utilities is management of our um, efficiency and conservation program. So um, Angle Utilities provides full water service uh, to the city as well as wastewater um, collection. When we're talking water efficiency, that's that's by and large synonymous with conservation in the water utility, but I will talk about other, a couple other aspects of, of what we're doing that <clears throat> um, that, that support, support a, um, a sustainable approach to our, our water system management. Um, this is really becoming important in the water utility, particularly out west, because of um, challenges we're, we're facing now, and we expect those to continue in the future with, with population uh, growth, increasing our demand, and then climate change impacting um, the availability and, and timing of the water we receive. So in terms of, of how our water is being used, um, this, is a, this is a snapshot of, of, of where the demand lies in our system. So over half of it is, is residential, um, about a third of it is, um, is on the commercial, industrial, and municipal side, which which is pretty consistent with what we would expect with a community like Englewood and, and, and how those up. Um, but what's really unique to, to Englewood is that, that yellowish uh, piece of the pie, and that, that's unbilled water. So we still have, Englewood has about 11,000 utility accounts, and we have um, about 12 to 1,300 of those that are still on flat rates, meaning there is no meter. They pay a fixed rate based on um, based on what, what customer type they are. 
Um, and, and as you can imagine, with the with the non metered service, that can present a couple challenges in terms of 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 um, of efficient water use. Um, one of which is is we can't detect leaks if we're if we're not metering it. We don't know where that water is going, so there could potentially be an undetected leak that that could persist um, um, for a long time. The other part of it is it's, it's not providing a, a financial incentive to to use less water. Um, the third is that a lot of our flat rate customers are actually paying more on a flat rate than they otherwise would um, on metered service. So, so there's actually benefits across the utility and there's also benefits to the customer of, of addressing those, um, those unmetered or unbilled um, customers. So in terms of what our water use pattern looks like throughout the year, um, this is pretty typical of what you would see in, in a climate such as ours. The orange bar is our is our indoor use that stays pretty consistent throughout the year. That's taking showers and washing your clothes and running the dishwasher and flushing toilets. Um, again, stays pretty flat. That's really independent of of what's happening, um, you know, weather wise or 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 which season it is. And and what really is impacted um, for seasonal use is our outdoor water use. And so. In Englewood, we do have a lot of single family homes with lawns that get irrigated. So in the summer, we're seeing um, our demand almost double and well over half of that um, uh, being for outdoor or irrigation purposes. So, so this kind of helps understand how the water is being used in the seasonal pattern um, and then identifying some of the areas where we can target um, uh, conservation programs. So this is all based on on water production, and this is this is this is water that we are producing at our treatment plant and sending out for distribution. Um, so, in terms of conservation, some of the benefits um, through water conservation conservation, you're, you, you know, you're probably pretty familiar with um, with a lot of these. From the sustainability side, I, I'll, I'll focus on just the energy and material usage to treat water. Um, less water that's being used or being used more efficiently is less water that needs the pumping. We have a system that pumps raw water up for treatment. We have all the energy and material usage to treat the water, and then we have water that gets pumped out um, uh, to the system. Another benefit of, of a reduction in water usage is, is um, reduction in, in capital investment and, and, and operational costs. So um, we, we have to forecast our future demands, and we um, we will ensure that we have the appropriate capacity to, to meet that demand. And if, if that demand can be controlled, then that's potential less uh, capital investment. Um, we're, our, our rates are based on, on use. So on the customer side, a reduction in water costs um, will direct for those that are on meters, um, will di directly uh, result in a lower water bill um, in a, in a in a semi-arid environment like like we are here, it's just general good resource stewardship um, to um, to to take a water efficient uh, approach to our management, and then it provides drought resiliency. All of our water comes through um, a portfolio of water rights, and so the more that we can um, conserve that water, the greater flexibility we we have with how we manage that portfolio. And so a couple of the programs that um, that we're targeting, Englewood is a little bit unique relative to some of the more growth um, areas like in Aurora or Parker in terms of where the, the, the biggest impact lies with our efficiency program. So for growth communities where there's a lot of greenfield development, um, there can be opportunity there to make sure that development is using modern um, conservation type of, of programs and tactics. For us, it's a little different. We're, we're mostly built out and we have been mostly built out for, for a long time. And so we have to be a little bit more strategic on how on, on where the, the biggest bang for the buck lies in, in conservation programs. So as I mentioned earlier, we still have a lot of our, our customers that are on, on flat rates and there's a lot of um, compelling reasons to, to get those onto meters. So that's something that we're, uh, we're aggressively pursuing. That was actually a, a, a um, a, uh, a recommendation out of the previous water efficiency plan. So we're in the process of, of updating our water efficiency plan. The first one was done back in um, in the 2013 fr time frame. So we're we're revisiting that one. A lot of the recommendations that are are still valid um, as we've begun to build up 
the utilities uh, team and our engineering team, we have more resources now to to address some of these. So this is the one that's 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 highest on our on our radar. And so we have <clears throat> continued to submit um, grant programs. We submitted one last year. We've got one currently under consideration now. We were successful in achieving a, a federally sponsored uh, loan program that has really favorable rates. So. Um, so a portion of that funding mechanism has been carved out to, um, uh, help, to help fund this program. So this one that's been kind of lingering for a while, we have a have a, a our city policy that requires it whenever ownership changes hands. Um, and there's an incentive program to uh, to try to encourage people to make those switch. That's you know that's been I would say lightly uh, lightly used. So just through those two programs, the 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 install rates actually been been fairly low um, year over year. So so this approach is allows us to take uh, or the funding and the grants are going to allow us to take uh, a more aggressive approach to installing meters. Uh, the other program we have is some some education um, uh, education opportunities for for um, for our residents to to help them understand how they can better conserve water. This is more focused on external again, because a lot of the the, the conservation um, impact in a lot of our water usage, particularly in the summer, obviously is through um, outdoor use of how how individuals can can better manage their outdoor water use. Um, a couple other programs are so leak detection. We are um, we will go out and proactively in the system look to identify where leaks occur. A lot of the leaks never surface, so you don't know that they're there. Some do, and, and when they do, that's usually a, a pretty large leak, and we'll immediately address that. But sometimes they don't, and and so we there are there are tools and systems that allow us to go find leaks that haven't surfaced, and where you would otherwise not know that they exist. And so obviously, if we have a leak in our system, that is water that's being lost. Um, and so when we find it, we can go and repair that and make sure we're not losing that anymore. Um, we have starting this year. Um, enacted a, an annually recurring water line replacement program as part of our capital improvement um, uh, capital improvement funds. And so again, that's that's replacement of old infrastructure that that could potentially has a leak or could potentially um, near its end of service life and could potentially break. And so we'll pro more proactively go after replacement of pipelines to avoid them um, breaking. Some of the ones that we are considering. So again, we are in the process of updating our water efficiency plan. And so some of the things that we're looking at, um, in addition to the, the the programs and projects I mentioned, moving forward, are um, including some water conservation guidance for new developments. So so we're mostly built out of built out community, but obviously we still have a lot of development going on. Everyone's seen the multifamily um, um, units that are coming in. So there are conservation. Um, opportunities there. And one of the things that we can do is uh, incentivize water efficient fixtures, or in some cases that can be required. And so that's something we're exploring as, as we continue to see um, some in, infill and redevelopment of our service area. Again, internal um, uh, internal fixtures, incentivizing those to be replaced with more water efficient um, equipment. And then maybe enhancing our education. So I, I showed a screenshot of our of our website. There, there's ways that we can be um, more proactive. And so as part of the water efficiency plan update, we're going to explore all of these. There's a, a, a cost, a um, an estimated benefit, or how much water would be conserved. Uh, resources from the city side to be able to manage these programs. And we we. Uh, we we basically list out all those opportunities. We analyze all the, the the factors associated with those, and we prioritize what programs and initiatives we're gonna we're gonna pursue moving forward. <clears throat> um, now beyond just the the conservation side, which again is a big part of sustainability and, and water utility management, there are other um, programs and initiatives that we are undertaking that also have a sustainability component to them, and and. And one of those is asset management. Um, that's a, 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 a somewhat general and vague term um, that applies to a lot of in different industries. And in water utility, we're looking at how can we maximize the life cycle of an asset and minimize our long-term operation and maintenance costs. So, so it's really it's right time replacement of all of our existing equipment. You don't want to replace it too early. 
um, where it still has useful life to it. And you don't want to do it too late when it when it's failed. Um, it also applies to how we plan for um, upgrades. And, and in some cases, we might have a higher initial cost with selecting a certain piece of equipment. But over the long term, on a life cycle basis, it's actually the most cost effective and the most sustainable. Um, we're working on design standards with our development review that will ensure that we're getting quality infrastructure that has a long useful life when, um, when we have new development that comes in that we may eventually take over. Um, we're working on a piping project. So the city ditch is, um, or in the planning phase of a piping project, city ditch is, is one of two, two ways we can deliver raw water that ultimately gets treated. Historically, most of our waters come off of the Platte River where we pump it. Um, one of the big advantages with city ditch is it's a gravity fed system. So instead of instead of all of the energy and um, and operational costs with pumping most of our raw water, we can convert this over to a gravity fed system um, that would allow so the piping would allow us to to move the majority of our water on a year round basis. So there's a lot of savings in there. And then we're just looking at how we can optimize our distribution system. That's all of the um, pumping and storage facilities that take water from the treatment plant and deliver it out to the customers. Anytime we can um, improve how we do, particularly pumping, pumping water is such an energy um, demanding process that whenever we can we can reduce that, um, we can uh, we see a lot of savings in terms of of less energy usage, less resource usage. So a lot of opportunity there. Um, in 20, uh, and this is my last slide, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of context of, of where we're at as a utility and, and where we're headed. The utility completed a master plan in 2020 that had identified um, a large suite of capital improvement projects to, to modernize um, the utility that was subsequently um, followed up by a rate and fee adjustment. So those of you, um, actually most of you are probably in Englewood, realize that we went through water and, and wastewater um, a fee increase that's allowing us to fund the projects and resources to enact these and so um, where historically might have not seen a lot of projects or programs really moving forward um, now we have the resources to do that so we're really excited about um, about what's ahead of us there's a lot of opportunity for us to um, to uh, make very impro improvements across the utility not the least of which is is on the sustainability side so that concludes what I had to present to all of you, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions. I've got one, Steve. Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I'm kind of a broken record on this, and it's probably a drop in the bucket. Ha ha. Um, Goodson Recreation Center. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if the city's ever looked at it or consider it, but um, there are signs about water conservation in the showers. Uh, it takes forever for the hot water to get through. There's lots and lots of water is going down the drain while people are waiting for the hot water to catch up. I don't know if that's true at Maley or not. It might not be worth the time and energy to fix it. I wish somebody would answer the question. Is, how big is the problem? Is it even worth addressing? And if not, I get it. There's obviously you got some big issues. I support your efforts, but symbolically, I think it sends a terrible message to people in the Goodson Recreation Center. You know, don't shave in the shower to save water. Mm -hmm. And then you stand there for five minutes waiting for the water to heat up. I keep bringing it up. It, it might just be an annoying question, but I really wish somebody would at least look at it and answer the question. I think that's a great point. I think it's something that, that we acknowledge. And, and you're right. What, there's a couple of things there. One is, um, Enough little things can add up. So what meet, might seem like a you know a small drop in the bucket, if you're able to to um, to execute enough of those, then then they could matter. But I think you're you're right on with the messaging part of it too, of of trying to promote and educate on water conservation, and then and then we have facilities that you are running gallons of water before you can even get into it because it. Right. I'm with that. I've been to the rec center and I know I know what you're talking about. I think it's a great okay. point. Yep. I think it's a really good point. Hey Steve, thanks for this presentation. Um and thanks for being here tonight. I feel like I was typing out 
four or five questions and you would answer them as I finished typing. So <laughs> you're right on. Um, regarding leaks, um, that's not a small chunk of change that you had on your slide in that that pie graph. Is, is does Inglewood have any sort of leak detection technology, or is Ingl the city doing any sort of water audit on an annual basis to see where you know we're, we're, how much <laughs> water we're losing, and have have, have y'all put a cost to that? Um. Two, two really good questions. On, on, the, on the first side of how are we going about leak detection, I would say it's more um, reactionary um, in comparison. So in my former utility, a much larger utility, so I had a lot more resources, but, but crews dedicated to just doing leak detection. And so what would happen is there would just be a sweep around the city and there's, there's various technologies that can do it. Um, to to basically track them down and then when they track them down they would be addressed and so um we're not set up yet to have a full sweeping citywide program it's something that we'll be looking into um you know as part as we continue to implement projects and programs and again having come in where we've got we've had a lot of deferred maintenance we have a lot on our priority list right now and so we're, we're there's a lot of which which one do we want to address first and what's the most critical programs? And so, um, so that one, that one is, is still kind of in that, in that prioritization. On the other side of being able to capture <clears throat> um, what is our water loss, we actually just submitted um, this summer our water loss audit. And so there is a, there's a, it's House Bill 1051 that, that um, it, doesn't necessarily require it, but it, it prevents you from accessing certain funding mechanisms if you don't submit a water loss audit. So we were a little overdue with that. So we we submitted ours this summer um, and actually submitted all of our reports back to 2013 to get us current. That actually allowed us to get a grant from the Colorado Water Conservation Board that's helping to fund our water efficiency plan. But um, we did do an audit. What's What's really challenging for audits for us is the fact that 16% of our customers, we don't know how much water they're using. And so, so what we have to do, that the, the numbers that we do know are how much raw water delivering to the plant, how much water we're producing at the plant. And then for 84% of our customers, we know how much water they're using because they have a meter. And so what we do then is we, we basically have to average all the customer types of how much we know they're using and apply that to those unmetered customers. And so um, water loss audits by them by are generally um, a little bit of an art and a science. It is much more of an art for us when we are completely blind to how much water 16% of our users are using. And so, so we'll continue to use the best method we can, the best data that we can. Um, but it's really going to be it's going to be much more um, accurate and can help drive um, how tight our system is once we eventually have it all metered. And so that metering project, um, we are hoping to say over the next three years, get them all on meters. So the next few years, we're still going to be in that space of of kind of whittling down that unmetered, but we're going to have a lot better idea. Uh, once we have all those in, and then it becomes a much more cor closer correlation to here much, here's how much water we're producing at the plant, here's how much water we're metering, and what's that difference. And if it's a big difference, we know we have a problem, and we would have yeah. to be, then we get more aggressive on our leak detection programs. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh. Um, do we have, do you know, what type of metering does Inglewood have right now? Is it AMR, AMI, is it older than that? I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's mostly AMR. We still have some walk-up meters. Um, one of the, I, I, I actually just reached out to one of our, our on-call engineers to help us with a business case on going to AMI. And so we kind of run the gamut of, of non-metered, which is decades old, yep. up to AMR, which is kind of current, to AMI. And so rather than kind of take the step approach of, non-meter to AMR to AMI, maybe it makes sense to align everything. And let's go ahead and put meters on this 16%. We 
With AMI systems, it usually makes sense to do a wholesale replacement. I suspect yeah. a lot of our meters are due for replacement anyway. And so what the business case would be was, well, maybe we take these two, you know, what had been originally planned as separate efforts of putting meters in and going to AMI, maybe we combine those and we just do a wholesale meter replacement. So that's one of the things we're going to look at, what, what the feasibility, what the business case is for that. But I, I, think, there, I think we're going to find there's going to be a lot of value and efficiency in just making the leap of like 1950s technology, which is no meters, to current at AMI. That's it was good to me that when, when I was talking to, to, to our on-call um, contract that's going to help us out with this, that um, it's really not even, the market isn't even, the, the current state of the market is you really can't get AMR. You can get AMIs that are back compatible with AMR, um, but that's really where the, the state of the art of the industry is now. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to chat more. Uh, final question. I'll be quiet. Um, I think you mentioned it. Um, are you hinted at it? Just 30,000 foot. Where does Inglewood generally get its water? You said we have a portfolio of water rights. Mm -hmm. Is it mostly from the South Platte? Is it? Yeah. So physically, all the water um, comes from the South Platte. And so for a, you know, relative to some of our, our larger neighbors, um, for a 35,000 service area, we have a we actually have a pretty robust water um, supply portfolio, and that goes back to the 1950s and 60s when when leadership at that point thought it'd be a really good idea to acquire those rights, and and it was a really good idea because it gives us a lot of um, um, gives us a lot of flexibility uh, moving forward. And so yes, yeah, so physically all the water comes off the South Platte River Basin. Um, some of that water is uh, is through exchanges. So we do have a couple trans uh, basin diversions. One of them is up at Boreas Pass, if you're familiar with that area, yeah. uh, between Como and Breckenridge. We actually own and operate the Meadow Creek Reservoir, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. That's up uh, outside of Winter Park. That water doesn't come to us, um, but we actually hold hold the water right. And this is where I'll, I'll try not to geek out too much on, on, on water rights, but Denver Water actually operates it. We own it through an agree agreement with Denver Water. We're able to take that water um, uh, out of Chatfield, basically, and then we can take it through the city ditch system. So um, the, the short answer is it comes from a dozen or more different water rights. Um, there's city ditch has its own set of water rights that, um, that we have access to. Um, there's other agreements with Denver Water that um, that provide water for us. It's very timely you asked that. We actually just completed our draft water resources master plan um, that uh, probably a, a third of that is just the description of, of the water rights. And there's a, a table with dozens of water rights on that of, of where all those supplies come from. And so, so it's a case where no single one really covers our entire demands yeah. added to mm -hmm. them and, you know, have, there's if you're familiar, there's different priorities. So we have this right, we go first when it's in priority. We can pull some of this um, if that's in priority. And, and it's it's a daily accounting and, and shuffling. Happy to geek out with you anytime over that more. Thanks for the answer. Yep, you bet. Um, in terms of piping the city ditch, I know they have tried to do that, they've accomplished most of it within the city uh, boundaries itself. But I remember back in the days that Littleton, I think the Littleton Seminary, Cemetery was uh, adamant that they did not want any ditch pipe through their property, that it was a, an amenity that they wanted to keep above ground. Are we still facing that kind of problem i think we're gonna it's very reasonable ex to expect that there's going to be um some public opposition to the project there's uh there's a select group of of homes that abut it that that would like to have their water feature continue um but it's a you know it's really a decision of 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 the value of that versus the value of um that water infrastructure to supply basically the entire city of Englewood. And so 
Um, so we can expect that there will be some opposition um, to that. I think um, I think we we there's there's many compelling reasons as to why um, it makes sense to do so. Back in 2000, I think 11 or 12, there was actually an intergovernmental agreement between Englewood and Littleton that acknowledged and documented um, the city's intention to pipe it and Littleton's acknowledgement that the purpose of City Ditch um, is for Englewood's water supply and that that usage should um, is prioritized over other usage. And this was related to um, some pedestrian trail. And so that was the agreement acknowledged that this is Englewood's primary raw water supply system and that you know pedestrian usage or aesthetics are secondary to that to that um, to that functionality. So that's a really important acknowledgement in the in the history of this project. And, and in, in fact that that document also acknowledged the Englewood's intention to to pipe the ditch. And so um so th this this concept has been out there for a decade um it's it's it come it came up during that period of time when the pedestrian trail was being um was being developed you can fully expect it to to come up again the portions that were were um planning on on piping are only up to the plant so there are downstream portions of city ditch that um the plan at this point is to keep those open channel <clears throat> we're looking at about um, maybe two, two and a half miles left that are that are still open uh, open channel. So we'll be kicking off a, an initial planning phase, which will include a public outreach um, component to it here in the next month or so. That's going to look at at public outreach. It's going to look at um, right away an easement. So city ditches dates back to the 1860s. So we can't go and find all of the or the easement documentation. So we'll have to go through an exercise with that, a permitting compliance uh, analysis. That's all this initial planning phase work that we want to address all of those before we get into further project development. What effect <laughs> did losing the Denver Parks uh, City Ditch uh, when T-Rex went through and we didn't have to supply all of those areas. Did that affect our water rights or does Denver still control some of those rights that they probably had for that? Yeah, it didn't it didn't affect ours. All of the the interesting thing about City Ditch is that Englewood owns it, but all of the contract users, it's it's all Denver's water. Our water rights allow us to divert off the South Platte or bring our water through City Ditch, but all of the contract users, it's all Denver water. It's just using our infrastructure to convey that water. So, so the answer okay. question, no, it didn't impact our our um, our water supply. <clears throat> and my understanding is is that when we bought all those water rights in the 1950s, we bought way more than we thought we would need because we thought we could uh, expand west and and get much more land etc and all that fell through so don't we actually have enough water rights for much more than our population or where do we stand with that What's important when we talk about the the um, the total supply of our water rights is the flexibility that allows us. And so, so with water rights, we don't always have the ability to 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 take that right, or we don't because of priority, or we don't always have the ability to take it because of the season of use. And so, um, so if you were to sum up the total of all of our water rights, they do exceed. The demand, but that 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 difference gives us flexibility, and it also gives us the ability um, to meet our demands looking forward. And so that was a really critical component of of the water resources ma master plan we just completed. A, an important part of that was forecasting what our our demand is, and then comparing 
our water rights portfolio to be able to meet that, recognizing that conditions are changing and and the availability of water and the other demands on the system are increasing. And so, um, so the, the, the good news is that foresight back then is what is allowing us, um, puts us in a strong position in terms of, of the strength of our water rights portfolio, whereas other utilities um, might have to be going out now, which is a very difficult time to do it, to acquiring new rights. Yeah. Right. Right. Steve, um, I feel like I'm reading and hearing that the rest of the state um, or the rest of the state's water rights are like over appropriated. Or is that unique to Inglewood? Is that just good planning 70 years ago? Or what would you attribute that to you? My experience and in, and in, in, in understanding Inglewood's water resources and getting to a water resources role since I've started this position is it. It puts, I think it puts us in a little bit of a unique position. Um, hmm. I don't suspect there's a lot of other utilities here in the front range that um, are feeling confident on the strength of their water resources portfolio for the next several decades. And, yeah. and, and we are. Good. Love it. As far as metering goes, are you going to need to have council pass? an ordinance to have all these non-metered properties metered because i know back in the 80s when nobody was metered hardly i mean the we overwhelmed the allen plant on a couple of hot days and the minute we implemented metering the use dropped dramatically in fact i think i don't think the allen plant even has the capacity to do what they needed to do back then uh, so does council need to to step up to get these places metered now there is a there's actually a clause in the city code that <coughs> that allows the city to require a meter installation. It's written, I, I presume, intentionally vague, but it, it allows the the city to um, to install a meter if it's deemed in the best interest of the city or the utility. So, so we actually do have some flexibility with that. Um, the question comes in, and, and where we would be coming back and, and getting direction from policymakers is who's going to pay for it. And so the city the city code does specify when ownership or <clears throat> or the type of usage changes that you have to install a meter and it actually specifies who pays for what um, that specification is a little different if we enact that clause of installing meter because it's in the best interest of the city uh -huh. and so now that now that we have access or potential access to to grant funds and some you know favorable loans that gives us more flexibility in terms of, of financing that because it's 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 not an insignificant amount of money to go and install 1300 meters. Yeah. Which then aligns to a separate effort. I talked about how metering ties into to AMI. We have lead services and so we would expect as those those older. Uh, those older homes that are still on flat rates. We expect that some of those are going to have lead service. We, we know that some of those are going to have lead service. And so, um, so that, that's where we can address and monetize most multiple components of when you're putting a meter in, there's a lead service line. Well, sure, you're going to go ahead and replace that lead service. And wow, maybe we could make part of this as a, an overall metering improvements through an AMI system. And again, access to more fundings. There's a lot of lead service line replacement funding out there. And so, so this is a really good opportunity and timing to um, to address these. <clears throat> that was going to be my next question. With some of these uh, federal funds that are coming available uh, for some of these pipes and things like that, is it, I have not been able to discern how much of that we could. Uh, appropriate or use is 
there going to be a good chunk of change for stuff like that? We, we, we think so, particularly as it relates to lead service. We were on a call um, late last week with the state and they indicated that um, there is a strong likelihood that that if we apply that those funds would be available. And it, in fact, I was a little surprised on on uh, on on how clear direction they provided on on you know the likelihood of us getting funds and the likelihood of, of, of utilities like us getting substantial amount of funds. So um, we're staying on top of that, and I think there's a good chance that we'll be able to get some some significant funding. I'm hopeful. Great. Great. Yeah. Hi, Steve. This is all super interesting, and um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think most of my questions have been answered along the way, and like uh, Bob, I was you know curious what the folks you know what you're planning to do if the folks sort of refuse to switch over to meter service. Um, I know I have a neighbor who loves her flat rate and has a huge cottonwood tree so she's yeah. probably one of the offenders there but, there's um, uh there's various strategies to doing that <coughs> one of which is it's going to happen eventually mm -hmm. and we can incentivize people volunteering by hey there's a limited amount of time where we have access to funds and so flat rates going away but if you if you want to um sign up to get on the list then there could be access to these fundings where where you could pay less or potentially nothing at all depending on you know how successful are we we are to getting those funds right um and i was kind of curious um you talked about it a little bit but as far as you know the the water planning goes um I, you know this year especially i think everybody can agree um it's been extremely dry um i you know neighbors um lots of people are just concerned about their trees dying you know over the winter just with the lack of uh precipitation that we've had so far um and i mean i assume all that's been accounted for um like in your you know in the water resources just for yep. the change of seasons and all that yeah um yeah yeah, when we do those type of things we, we do scenario planning and so you know one of the big impacts is is climate and and we have dry scenarios we have average scenarios keeping in mind that average for the last 10 years is probably not the same as the average for the the next 10 years um, mm -hmm. and so so we we set up scenarios with all the different factors that could impact our 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 access to our water or what our water rights will allow us and what the demand's going to be and so we have different climate conditions that will drive um, that water supply availability also will drive our our demands and what our customers are going to be asking. Um, the success of these conservation programs are that's a scenario planning. Um, mm -hmm. Long term impact of of new rates and fees, providing more of a financial incentive to use less water. So uh, yeah, it's it's a that's definitely something that's that's more art than science of of you know those type of planning processes but what what we try to do is is bookend and then we try to find a most real, realistic scenario and then we have a bandwidth around that yeah that's good to hear um one other thing um a little bit off topic but i know um we recently installed uh like a smart meter um it's called a, a mo and flow i don't you've probably heard of these things but just kind of wondering like what your take on those are um and you know i've personally found it really interesting um getting sort of like a weekly report on our water usage and um you know it can kind of like set goals for you and um you know use less water well, conservation that's the whole point um so just kind of curious you know if you've heard of those um devices and um you know if there's any you know worthwhile in sort of getting people to switch over you know or installing these sort of smart meters to you know they can get a visual weekly of like their water consumption which when you kind of see it in front of you um it tends to trigger like oh maybe you should you know do less of this or less of that i think it's a great idea i completely support it the people that are doing it 
proactively are the ones that already, um, I think, have a water efficient use mindset. That's the power of AMI. And so <clears throat> when you have AMI systems, you have all of that real time information. You can set up notifications that say, hey, your, your usage on this Monday is the, probably the same things that you've got with, with smart meters, um, but it can track your usage on a, on a, a more instantaneous basis and compare it to trends and immediately trigger of like, hey, something something is substantially different than what it was before. What does that mean? Well, maybe I've got a running toilet or maybe something blew on my irrigation system. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that's all really, really powerful information that can come with with an AMI um, type of system. We're kind of baby stepping there. So right now or right now we're in the monthly building, but as you all probably know, we were on quarterly building and so so that that's giving you a, a snapshot with four data points a year. So we're getting better now because now it's on a monthly basis and we can identify if there's substantial changes in, in water use from month to month. AMI gets you to the, you know, the minute by minute, hour by hour, and, and um, also gives people, uh, I just thinking in a mindset of being more closely tied to their water use, right? So if you're getting a bill once every three months, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like financial management, I feel like. When you when you have the daily reminder and it shows you how much you spend every single day, well, your your financial management is a little bit different than if you're only looking at it once a month. It's the same thing with water. And so that's, that's one of the really attractive benefits with AMI. And one of the reasons when we go into AMI, there's a conservation component to it because we can expect people to be using less water because they're going to be paying more attention. Awesome. One of the things that has kind of bothered me in the past is that because we have had this abundance of water within the Englewood system, there has not been a huge push to accent conservation, to look at xeriscape projects, to look at, uh, uh, you know, incentives for water conservation and toilets, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of citizens have done it on their own mm. as the uh, prices have increased, but are there plans to really step forward in this area? I think that's something we'll look at with our efficiency plan of how we can be more proactive um, in that. And, and you're absolutely right. It's it's the benefit of having a strong and robust water resources portfolio that doesn't put us in a position that you know that might have mandatory watering restrictions. To my knowledge, I don't I don't know of Englewood ever having to do that, um, which in some ways is a good thing. But you know the the downside to that can be that you know when we probably should be dialing back our watering, we're we're not we're not requiring. And there's a whole slew of of um, of uh, you know, associated resources that are necessary to get into, you know, to water restriction type programs. But um, I think it's a great point. I've, I've thought about it too. I think it's something that we'll, we'll have to explore um, as part of that efficiency plan and education to, uh, you know, to better educate, even though we're not saying you have to do this, recognize that before any of us were here, we didn't have green lawns and we didn't have big mature trees. And so um, let's keep that in mind. And, and again, I think, I think it's more education incentivizing versus um, being taking more restrictive actions. Um, and again, that ultimately is something that comes up to, to our, our policymakers, but uh, well, yeah, it is. It's something we'll take a look at as part of the efficiency plan. I, I do think there's there's probably some education incentive um, opportunities for us. Great. Yeah. I. Uh, uh, can I ask I one? Remember. Yeah. Go Just ahead. a quick question. We haven't even talked, but I'm curious. Um, has the city ever looked at uh, non-potable water 
or gray water. I'm thinking of uh, for the parks, areas like that. Uh, I'm sure there's an infrastructure issue there, but has it ever been considered or looked at to to uh, not use expensive water to water the grass in the parks? Yeah, it's something that um, as part of that federal lending loan program I, I had mentioned, um, putting together a water reuse um, plan or strategy is, is, is something that, that, that we are planning to do. Um, again, as a build-out community, it becomes a little bit difficult to do it, you know, where it's like individual homes and separate your outdoor irrigation from your indoor. But we have parks and we have a golf course, and um, it's something that we will look into. That actually ties really close to our water, um, our water rights, because certain water rights allow us to reuse. Certain water rights are are single use, and so um, so that that actually aligns with part of the analysis of the water resources master plan is where do we have opportunities for for water. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know if we've done any type of formal study in the past, but it is something that we're that we are planning to do. And the good news is we own half of a water reclamation facility that's just up the river that could potentially be the source of that. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah, another thing that Mike's question brings to mind is a lot of our parks and even I don't know how much of the golf course is watered with wells and groundwater and that kind of aspect. Uh, how How is that moving forward? I mean, I know we went from, oh, we'll just estimate how much we're using to actually putting meters on all of those uh, uh, pumps to actual actually measure how much we were pulling out and uh, and then that had to be uh, counterbalanced with our water rights as I understand it is that I'm sure that's still going forward correct yep that's that's still going forward um, one of the things we looked at um, at the conclusion of of last summer um, for Broken Tea was the ability for us to use some some of our rights. So we have it's called the McRoom Ditch. It's a it's basically a pipeline that goes from Bear Creek to um, where our intake is off of the the Platte River. Um, in area in, or in times when those groundwaters aren't producing um, as much as the golf course would like them to produce, that we can supplement that with rights that we have elsewhere. Um, so we actually were able to do that. We we're able to get the water commissioner to agree to allow us to use those rights um, in a urgent or emergency type situation where the groundwater wells aren't aren't producing what is is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Things have definitely changed in the last thirty years. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? OK, Steve, this has been really informative. I think you uh, uh, have a lot on your plate right now, so it's good to hear a lot of this and we'll see how we can fit, fit in and actually help the situation, hopefully. Well, I, I appreciate the time and I appreciate you inviting me to come chat. I'm happy to uh, to come back at any point in time. We'll be wrapping up our efficiency plan. Um, the initial draft in the next couple months that goes through a review period. I'm happy to return and, <laughs> and um, discuss with this group what, uh, what we found out with our efficiency plan. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you're you. Thank you. Bet. You're welcome. Great. Oh, I appreciate all of your input into that. That's some 
a very important component to what we're going to be dealing with, I think. I figured out where the minutes are. When she sends out the agenda, there's a link on the agenda to the minutes from the uh, uh, last meeting. I just thought that it was a separate thing and I couldn't find them. So as if you open the agenda, then the minutes, they have the draft minutes on the agenda there. So as I looked over them, they're, they're really pretty simple. I don't think there's any problems, but if you haven't looked over that, I'd appreciate you just taking a minute and then we can uh, accept them or modify them if it's necessary. Do I hear any need for changes? <coughs> Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to accept them as drafted. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion is carried unanimously. OK, the next thing on our agenda is to discuss our uh, meetings with our interviews with the applicants for the sustainability coordinators position. Tim, probably you'd be the best one to do that. Yeah, happy to give a quick update. So first of all, I want to thank Bob for participating in the panels. Um, so we had nine applicants, um, which isn't a huge pool, although we um, just like, kind of overall during the great resignation, we've kind of seen lower amounts of people applying. However, in that pool of nine, we've seen some incredibly qualified candidates. Um, the calendar has been a little bit tricky with the holidays. Um, so let's see, we have we've advanced three candidates so far to a panel um, that included Bob, um, one of our deputy directors of South Platte Renew, Blair Corning uh, for environmental programs and our um, neighborhood resources coordinator, Madeline Hinkfis. So the panels interviewed three candidates. Um, I've screened a few more. Um, I had one screen interview this afternoon and then I have another one tomorrow. Um, sorry, Bob, but I think the one this afternoon I want to advance to the panel later in the week um, and then we'll see about the one tomorrow. Um, I think we're incredibly lucky being in the area that we are and there's a lot of people who are drawn to Colorado because of their passion for the environment and sustainability. Um, a lot of the universities have phenomenal undergrad and grad programs um, and so we have some really top quality candidates. I think it'll be a very difficult decision. I know it will be. Um, and by the next time you meet, I will, I hope, I shouldn't guarantee, I want to guarantee, um, but I want to guarantee um, that we'll have a coordinator on board, um, or at least about to be on board, that I'll be able to introduce you to in February. Great. And just speaking from the three that we have interviewed, any one of the three I thought could do the job and step in and be a positive influence. So I'm really encouraged by that. And I believe council, even as we speak, are interviewing more candidates for the board. We have, uh, I think, six applicants for the Sustainability Commission. So that's another good thing. There's a lot of interest out there in doing this type of thing. So I think we're in a good position moving yeah. forward to uh, yeah. not only have great people both on staff and on the board, but the ability to impact decisions and progress. So I, I think it's a great place to be. Any other questions or comments? Okay. 
Do we have anything else on the agenda? I thought this was an interesting uh, uh, discussion and water is going to be very key to our environment and, and this climate in the next 10 years. I can see big change, even bigger changes that are coming than in the last 10. I'd love to get Steve back on once they finish their efficiency plan. Mm -hmm. I think that's something, Tim, that you'll want to make a note of and and we will continue to monitor that. As far as our situation goes, I will chair the meeting next month in February and uh, then we will go from there and see where we're at. Hopefully we'll have some new members by then. I think they're going to announce the choice sometime or right around the time that we meet. So maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure on their, on the timing of that. Okay. Can I, well, uh, okay, if I just ask the group one quick question and we can certainly do a poll on this, um, but I know there's been some interest kind of expressed in going back to, I don't think we would go to it fully in person, but there's been some interest expressed um, going to a hybrid meeting approach. Is that something you'd like to do or we can just, I can have Nina send a poll around if you want to, you'd rather just do it that way. Um, or if you have an opinion tonight, um, just so we know we can plan for February. I'd like to go back to in-person meetings. I like the option, um, but I also think it's nice to kind of get together from time to time and see everyone. Seconded. Yes, I, I would be in favor of doing in-person with the hybrid option if somebody's not comfortable or not available, maybe they can get on through the team link or Zoom or whatever. So yeah, that would be great. Great. I agree with all that. Great idea. I will go forward then and plan for the February meeting to be hybrid. So we'll probably try to do it in our Pikes Peak conference room, which has really good capabilities of doing hybrid meetings. Um, it is subject to change, of course. If you know things get worse with COVID, we might have to not, we might not be able to do it. Um, but we'll keep, we'll keep you posted, and we'll plan for a hybrid meeting in February. Right. Well, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. This has been great. Everybody wants to stay, I guess. So move. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good to see y'all. Thanks. Bye bye.